Well, I don't know what you've done today. Probably been running out in the rain, doing a lot of things. And to some extent, we might not say this is a good day, right? Uh, we enjoy the weather, but it's uh, when it's cloudy, it doesn't make you feel like that. But when we come to what's called Good Friday, it is a very significant day for Christians to observe what happened historically. So we we do that because uh, we want to remember all that's been done historically. It's not an aberration of somebody's thinking. It's not a mistake. It's something that happened historically. Years ago when I was a kid, I'm dating myself now. Uh, some of you may remember when uh, Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Disney ended, who sang the last song on uh, Wonderful World of Disney. It was a character by the name of, yeah, you know you're not going to say, Jiminy Cricket. He's long gone. I don't know what happened to Jiminy. <clears throat> He sang a song that was originally sung by Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. And uh, you might remember this. It says, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. <clears throat> and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me, where troubles melt like lemon drops way above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me. Now, it's a nice little song. It's a kind of a cute little song when you see a little fictional cricket sing it. But if you think about that sentiment, which has been sung a number of times through years by a number of different people, it's really uh, the sentiment is nothing more than sappy sentimental sentimentalism because it has no, has no ultimate meaning. There is no rainbow by which you can go over it and find, let alone a pot of gold, let alone have all your troubles just kind of fall away. That just doesn't happen. And so when we come to a time like this, it's important to remember that we live in a world that is um, either used to ignoring truth, especially biblical truth, and doesn't want to face it at all, which is probably increasingly more the mindset of more people today, or to say it's some kind of mushy sentimentalism. That somehow we just love and, and, and we, we love Jesus and Jesus loves us and we're all going to get along. But there's something that is terribly unsatisfying about that, I think. That's why when we come to the Easter season, especially when we come to what we call Good Friday, I'm not sure who really called it Good Friday. First of all, I think it was the Catholics a number of years ago termed it Good Friday. But when we think about what is good, it's, it's on one sense, we look at the histor historicity of what went on. From man's perspective, it was not good. From God's perspective, it was eternally good, beyond good, and that he would come and he would bless all who would believe in what went on during that day. So you might remember the historical setting. Jesus had uh, been preaching for three years, and he came to Jerusalem. As he came into the city, he had told his disciples that he knew what was awaiting him. He knew that uh, he was going there. He even told them that he was going there to be crucified. That was the way in which they dealt with uh, the criminals at the time. If you were not um, privy enough to be crucified or to be killed in a in a um, somewhat a more civilized way, you were hung upon a cross in a cruel way to die. Jesus knew that was going to happen to him. Yet he came, said he went to Jerusalem and met with his disciples. And you remember he told them he was he came down the Mount of Olives, and um, as he did, he had proclaimed that there was going to be a miraculous nature by what was happening to him. He went to the temple area. <clears throat> he completely kicked everybody out of the temple area, all the ones that were selling things, and, and he said, making my father's house a den of thieves. And so he chased them all out. You might remember that after that, <clears throat> as he'd come down the mountain, all the Jews had, had really been saying, Hail, King of the Jews, because they thought at this time, since they knew the miraculous nature of what Jesus was doing, that he was going to come proclaiming himself to be king. They're going to kick off the authority of the nation of Rome, and they're going to be free once again. <clears throat> of course, we know that didn't happen. Jesus allowed himself to be taken captive in Gethsemane, and he went through all the ignominious things that we associate with the with six trials that were unjust and illegal, and then he went to the cross willingly to suffer for our sins. So we look at that, and we, if you've ever seen a picture, or even have any kind of an idea of what it is, uh, it's a it's a very 
troubling picture, humanly speaking. But it's important for us to remember what went on that time, because sometimes we look at Good Friday and we forget that, in one sense, this is the most important date in the Christian calendar. We all think of Christmas, and Christmas certainly has its significance, celebrating the birth of Jesus, and that's probably at the apex of most even Christian celebration. But then somebody may back off that, well, no, it's really Easter, because Easter celebrates the resurrection. And it does that, but if you push that back even further, the resurrection would not even been significant unless what happened on Friday took place. The resurrection is only in way in which the, the events that happened on Friday were given proof because he did raise himself from the dead. That proved what he did, but it's what he did on Friday that's the most significant. That's why we call this the work of Christ. And if you've ever thought about Jesus doing work, but this is work. I don't know what your most significant time of work is. I can remember a different time in my life. I thought I was working hard, and I probably was. Remember out of high school, I had a job with a construction company, and one of the projects we had in Southern California was t from from uh, Orange County all the way to San Diego. Really going to date myself now is back when the San Diego freeway was just two lanes each direction, and so our job was to knock out all the bridge abutments all the way down the 405 freeway. So this 19-year-old kid running a 96-pound jackhammer all day long was hard work. And I would come home at night complaining, crying to my dad about hard work. He said, well, son, you picked it, so you have to do it. So that's hard work. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to what we see here. So when we think of Jesus' work on the cross, let's not think of it just in a physical sense. Let's not think of, well, he worked up a sweat, he worked hard, he got calluses. No, that's not it. And yet what Jesus did on the cross is an incredible um, feet for us to look back and see what happened. First thing we need to notice about that, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, we sometimes throw those words out pretty easily, but just think of this. Can you imagine at all having any kind of prophetic insight into what would happen in the year 2724? I mean, we wouldn't have a clue. We wouldn't have a clue if this nation was even going to be around at that time. We wouldn't have a clue about anything, uh, technology, whatever that might have gone on. And yet those prophecies that were given in the Old Testament specifically came true when Jesus went to the cross in so many different fashions. In the book of Isaiah, one of those Old Testament prophets in chapter 53, verse 3, it says this, He was despised <clears throat> and forsaken men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. <clears throat> He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. <coughs> Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities, and chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. So we look at that in even Old Testament sense. You look at even Old Testament scholars, and I've talked to several Jewish scholars along the way, and said, in a Jewish context, who would that apply to? Who possibly fulfilled that? And the answer is that there's nobody they've been able to turn up with that fulfilled that. Well, Jesus fulfilled that perfectly. 700 years after the prophet Isaiah talked about it happening, he was despised and forsaken of men. By the time Jesus went to the cross, his own disciples had turned tail and run. His family was there, but they were inept. They didn't know what to do with it. And at that time, no doubt at that time, his brothers didn't even really believe in who he was. We know that he had no earthly position or privilege at that time. He didn't have status. He didn't have, he didn't have money. He didn't have prestige. He didn't have power. He had, he had nothing that would counteract the, the in, incoming hurled, or uh, at webs and be hurled at him by Rome. And yet he was willing to take our grief, to take our sorrow in an infinite way because he was infinitely God so that he could take upon himself the sins of mankind. So those words come out of us pretty easily, and we've 
probably reviewed them before, but when we stop long enough to thank them, though, we think that's an incredible, incredible picture. And it's not a pretty picture, is it? It's not a pretty picture because it deals not just with human suffering, and it does. It's not a pretty picture just because it deals with man's inhumanity to man, which it is. It's not a pretty picture just because it deals with one Roman oppressive government against a group of people who couldn't defend themselves, which it was. All those things are true, but that's ultimately not why, ultimately it's, a, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture because of what the Bible says the main problem of man. Of course, the main problem of mankind is, is not in my economic surroundings. The main problem of man is not in my socioeconomic place that I have in this world. The problem of man is not with my parents. The problem of man is not because of my lack of education. The main problem of man is not because of my family status. The main problem of man is much deeper than all those, isn't it? It's here. It's right here. And how could we ever anticipate anybody that would reach in the heart of any other person, let alone all of humanity, and even attempt to address that problem? But that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's why the punishment that came on him was not pretty. Because the thing that he was overcoming on that Friday was not pretty at all. Verse 6 in Isaiah 53 goes on to say, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall upon him. And he was oppressed. and He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. And he did not open his mouth. Then verse 10, it says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Now you, you think of that. The Lord, God, his heavenly Father, was pleased to crush him. Now that doesn't sound like a very <laughs> loving, familial thing to happen, does it? But the Lord God was pleased to crush the manifestation of who he was on this earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, because he knew that that was the only way that mankind's sin could be alleviated. So to accomplish that, he was willing to do that. And he was willing to put him to grief so he would render himself as a guilt offering. He would see his offspring. He would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. So these words that were given 700 years before Jesus went to the cross on that agonizing Friday remind us that it wasn't just a simple act that kind of happened by chance. This act had been prophesied hundreds of years before and anticipated as the prophets understood there would become who would, one who would come and do this. But secondly, this act showed Christ's ultimate and final victory over evil. Now, and I don't know if you've ever had the satisfaction of seeing somebody that's done evil towards you get what's coming to them. We all want to see that, don't we? From the first time on a schoolyard, when Billy Cannon and I got into it playing baseball one day, and he's a year older than I am, but I thought I could take him. And he proceeded to, we'll call a lot of different things, but I didn't take him. Hit me in the neck, and I, uh, and I went down in a heap. From that day on, I had an animosity toward Bill, and I wanted to get even, right? So when we see bullies like that, we say, that just shouldn't happen. And then later on, we grow old and we see other things that happen. We have broken relationships. We get into the job community. We see people that cheat to get ahead. You go on, you can list a whole long list of things that are done, and our heart cries out for justice. That's just part of us being made in the image of God. Our heart cries out, say, somebody should do something about this. The bullies of the world, the broken relationships should not be able to get by the way they do. The cheaters, the liars, the schemers, the murderers, the rapists, you go on and on. Somebody should do something about that. Well, that's what Jesus did. We find the first prophetic implication of what he would do to tell us what he would do is in Genesis 
3, it says, He will put enmity between you and the woman and between you and your seed, your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. It speaks to the fact that Satan would have a fatal blow that would be given to him in the future. A fatal blow. We know that's exactly what happened. When Jesus stepped into human history, he stepped in not to just be a, a good moral man. He didn't step in to be a Sunday school lesson. He didn't step in even to be the ultimate cop, the judge, or anything. He stepped in to be the redeemer of mankind. He stepped in to, to reach inside the heart of man and say, there's a problem deep inside there, and I will alleviate that. I will cover that if you come to me. That's far greater than anything that, that we can imagine. We get, find going on in the book of Genesis, God stepped in and redeemed even the sin of Adam and Eve, the first people on the earth. He said, after they'd sinned and eaten from the tree, he said, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. I, I always find that just an incredibly revealing statement. They had been naked all of their lives, right? However long that was. Them to, but now all of a sudden, after they stepped outside God's boundaries, then they knew they were naked. And they made this pitiful attempt to cover up. Then you remember God coming in the garden, and, and he called out to Adam and said, where are you? And he said, I'm here. And he said, uh, what's happening? He said, well, it's that woman you gave me. That's the first of passing judgment on somebody else. And by the way, God never let him get away with that, did it? It wasn't a woman's fault. Where did God lay the blame on? On Adam. She may have been deceived, but Adam, you're the one that knew. You entered in that full well. And then God told him, he said, well, who in the world told you you were naked? You see, when we sin, <clears throat> there's something just innate in all of us that know that we are exposed before God. <clears throat> that know somehow that spiritually we are undone. We are exposed before the all knowing, all seeing gaze of God who can stare into our heart, into our soul, know our background, know everything that's there, and see that we are undone. That's what Peter said. You remember when he uh when Jesus came to him on the Sea of Galilee and said, How was the fishing? He goes, That wasn't very good. And Jesus said, Well, go out and throw your nets out again. And Peter said, You know, we were fishing all night, we didn't get anything. And Jesus said, Go throw the nets out again. And I just have a feeling that Peter looked at the boat and he said, see that, see that name on the boat? It says, Peter and brother. That's me. I'm the fisherman. I own that company. I've been out. I'm telling you, there's no, no fish to be had tonight. Jesus said, go out and throw the nets on the other side. And he did. And you remember the rest of that story. There were so many fish climbed into the nets that the, that the boats almost capsized. And what was Peter's reaction? Peter's reaction, I think, would have been the same as your reaction if you had seen it. Peter came to Jesus and said, go away from me. I'm undone. I'm a sinful man. Repeats what Isaiah said back in Isaiah 6 when he confronted God. You see, when we see the righteousness, we see the holiness of God, our sin is exposed. We know we're naked. Anyone that's halfway honest knows that. We don't have to admit to anybody. We lay down at night and stare up at the roof in our homes as we go to sleep. We, If we're honest, we go, yeah, I know I'm exposed before God. I know I'm naked before a righteous, holy God. In fact, is that's why Romans 5 tells us that happened to all mankind. It said, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death came through sin, and no death. And so death spread to all men because all sin. All of our sin is exposed before a righteous, holy God. That means we are spiritually dead. In Ephesians 2, it says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, to which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We are born physically alive, but spiritually dead. There is nothing that resides good in a dead man. Nothing. The Bible also says that in our natural state, it says we are spiritual beings, but but we don't have any ability to choose God. In fact, as the Bible says in Romans 8, Paul says, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
That means man is helpless and hopeless before God. And I think that word, to tell you the truth, I think it probably is a good word to describe most people's hearts. They're hostile towards God. You go out and begin a conversation with a man on the street, you don't get very far. Unless God has done something to intervene. Mankind's hostile toward it. We don't want to talk about that. It's because the Bible says that mankind is even unable and unwilling to seek God. In Romans 3, <clears throat> Paul says that this way, he said, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There are none who seeks for God. Say, so, well, okay, then that leaves us where? Where do we go back with all the stuff we've heard about on Good Friday, and yet you say mankind is, is unable, he's born in sin, and he can't do anything to choose God himself? He's hostile towards God, he's undone, so I'll live my own life the way I want to. See, that's why we say that God had to intervene. If mankind was going to have a relationship with God, it had to be up to God. I had several times in my childhood when I was a friend that my I was uh, so thankful that my dad intervened. Um, my brothers and I in the summertime spent our summer days playing baseball down at the school. <clears throat> Almost every day, all afternoon, one day, the same family, remember I told you a guy about it, came and hit me in the throat? Same family, they had a bunch of redhead punks. No redheads in here. All these guys were redhead, and they were just as feisty as could be. My older brother got into it at second base with the oldest of that group of guys. And my brother wasn't smart enough to know that I wasn't going to back him up. <laughs> so he was out there at second base ready to duke it out with this guy. And I thought he's going to get his clock cleaned. And how have his brothers around this? And now is he going to get his clock cleaned? I'm going to get my clock cleaned. So as fast as I could, I ran the two blocks back home. Got my dad. Dad, Dave's about ready to get pounded down at the school. My dad comes running down there into this freak is just about ready to break loose. And the school said, break it up, boys. That's my dad. That's what we need God for. Because we're on second base and we're ready to duke it out with somebody who's going to clean our clock. That's Satan himself. God has to intervene. And he did intervene. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, but when this perishable will put on the imperishable and this material will put on immortality, then will come about the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He intervened. He came to our aid. He came to our rescue. He provided a way so that we are not exposed to the onslaught of Satan himself when we come and we find a refuge in him. See, Satan, I believe, even thought at that time when he's on this earth facing Jesus, I think he thought that he'd won by killing Jesus. I think he thought that somehow, even when he'd taken Jesus into the wilderness to tempt him, that somehow he would find his Achilles tendon, so to speak. And I think he thought he could defeat him. When Jesus went to the cross, though, and gave up his life and rose from the dead, <clears throat> he proclaimed that that was not true. You see, <clears throat> when Jesus did that, infinite God in the flesh bore an infinite, um, not only a responsibility, but, but bore upon himself an infinite punishment for mankind. We couldn't do it, but he did. So everyone wants to see justice, and yet we know that's just not going to happen in this world, right? We depend. We kind of look at our justice system. We've got a, a, a probably better than any in the nation in the world, a justice system in America. But does, does it work all the time? No, it doesn't. God's justice system is a system that works all the time, every time, in perfect order, in perfect justice. That's what we need. That's what we want. But it only happens when we come to him and recognize that he has paid the debt for our sins so that the justice that we are due is taken by him just as he takes the punishment for all that would come to him. So he paid the debt for our sins. Third thing he did is his, his Jesus' death on the cross to accomplish Christ's most important work. And what was that? 
It was not social reformation. It was not pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It wasn't earn your way to heaven in some way. It wasn't turn over a new leaf. It was none of those things. What Jesus came to do was accomplish salvation for all who would come to him. Galatians 3 says it this way. <clears throat> Christ redeemed us. Now here's where you get start getting some words. You want to think about work. Here is Jesus' work. When he went to the cross, six judgments, six trials, if you were, that were illegal. But by the time 9 o'clock worked around the morning, they were ready to take to Jesus and nail him to the cross. From the hours of approximately noon to 3 in the afternoon, it grew dark. Many people say that that's the time when Jesus was doing his work. I think it's as good as any other placement to, to look at what's happening. During that time, Jesus hung on the cross and it was dark. Jesus did his work far greater than what we could do, far greater than anything we can imagine. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Now you think about that. Having become a curse for us. Jesus, the perfect one, the impeccable one, the one who was God in the flesh, never sinned in any fashion, suffered in everything that we do, knew all the temptations, but he never sinned. He became a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on the tree, in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. <clears throat> That's not an iffy proposition. That's not, well, maybe it works. That's not, I hope something good happens out of it. And certainly it's not, well, that's too bad that that would happen to such, what's to such a nice guy. It wasn't any of that. He redeemed us. He paid the price for our sin. What price does your sin elicit? What, what, what does it take to cover your sin? How much? Draw out your checkbook, get a couple of credit cards. What would you do to cover your sin? You see, when we start piling it up, one after another, after another, after another, year after year after year, we go to God like a, we'd go to a judge today and he said, well, look at here, now if you've got all these priors on your record, what are you going to do with that? And I'm undone. But I look at my defense attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he says, judge, <clears throat> he's with me. And my payment has been made so that he can go free. First Peter 1.18 says, As knowing that you were not redeemed <clears throat> with perishable things like silver or gold from your, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You see, we understand that we understand the we understand the characteristics of blood to some degree. We know, now know that life is in the blood. The Bible said that from the very beginning. But it wasn't until 150 years ago that, that physicians stopped cutting people to bleed out of them when they had a disease because, well, we have to get the poisonous blood out of them. You don't do that anymore, right? You transfuse good blood into them. Why? Because life is in the blood. That's why many people look at Christianity and say, well, it's such a bloody religion. Well, it's because it's a religion that stresses the very nature of life itself and that our sin is an affront to God. And if not, nothing happens, then, then our sin will be our undoing. So he had to do something, and he redeemed it. Another word it says in the Bible is he reconciled us. In other words, he settled our accounts. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, he says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself, through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the word world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So what did he do? Reconciled means, I don't know if we do this and we used to do this with a checkbook, now it's all done automatically unfortunately or fortunately. You take together all the debts, all the checks, you list them out. 
And then you list this amount over here that you look, I don't know if that's going to cover that. And you try and reconcile your, your check, but by looking at all that you spent with all that you have coming in. And if that doesn't up, come down to be an equal amount at the end of the time, that means usually, usually doesn't mean that you've got more money than you thought. It usually means you have less money because you, you didn't reconcile it right. But when it's reconciled, right, it comes right down to the penny. So the expenditures agree with the income. That's what it means to be reconciled. God, through Jesus Christ, reconciled us with himself through the payment of Jesus Christ. He looked at our sin and he credited his righteousness to our account. So the bottom line of our account, Jesus' righteousness is written there so that we don't reconcile ourselves. We can't do that. You have a lot of other passages saying what he did. We also know the one that's used probably the most prominently is he died for us. Not only he redeem us, that he reconciled us, but he died for us. First Peter 2.18, for Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having, put, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. That's why when he got to the finish, he got to the place where he was finished with his work on the cross, he said, it's finished. It's done. It's the end of the day. Nothing more needs to be done. That's the work of Christ. You see, that's why the resurrection is important because it validates this. But the work of Christ was really done on Friday. The work of Christ on the cross is when he went to the cross willingly allowing himself to take the torture of mankind and then even see that mankind would take his life. And when he's on the cross, that perfect one giving himself for our sins, that's when he did his work. So the resurrection gives proof to that. And we're thankful for the resurrection because we know that he accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish on the cross because he was resurrected from the dead. And you can validate that. So the physical death that Jesus went through is only part of the equation. We know that when he went to the cross, he accomplished some things far greater than we could do for ourselves. Romans 8, 28, Paul tells us, this, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. Isn't that true? Isn't that an accurate description? It's like a, a lady, not making fun of this, but a woman in labor. She, she, she's going through agony at times, great travail, sometimes great pain to bring this new little life into this world. That's what that's what Paul says life is like. We travail as if collectively we are in childbirth because we look around and we know something's wrong with this picture. Something's wrong with this world. And the Bible gives the answer, yes, there is something wrong, and it's here in the heart of mankind. But Paul goes on to say, and now not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the, re the redemption of our body. See, that's what we're waiting for. That's what Friday tells us. Here's the work of Christ. But we're now waiting when the culmination will take place when he will return to this earth or we will die in him before then, and he will reconcile these things and he will make them right. And he won't repair just the broken systems of this world. He will hold every man accountable to his ultimate standard of righteousness. When we were kids, we weren't playing the playground. We'd play on the uh, sandlot. If you've seen that movie, that's the way I grew up. We were playing the sandlot right next to my house. It was my grandmother's house. <clears throat> Probably about at least once a month through the summertime, my dad would have to come over and fix the window in the back of Grandma's house because that was the backstop for our pitching. And the guy that was catching didn't catch it all the time. Or foul tip would go back and bam, there goes another window. And so we would wait for Dad to get home, knowing what kind of judgment is going to happen. We'd get the lecture about your kid playing there and can't do it. But it happened every summer, three or four times a summer. Now, someday, my friend, the window is going to stop being broken. The ultimate judge will come, 
and will stop fixing windows on this earth. He will fix hearts, and he will repair the damage that's been done by mankind's sin against other people and that other people's sin against us. He will repair that breach. And how does that happen? Well, the Bible is very clear on that. If you want to just one word for it, the word that Jesus gave is simply repent. Repent. That just simply means you, we look honestly at our life and we say, you know something, there's things there that I don't like about myself, let alone what other people, but I know myself. The Bible says, I want to repent of that. And then what? The Bible says we are to believe. Believe in this message that God took on a human body, became Jesus in the flesh, in this world, came to go to the cross to pay for our sin so that by faith believing we would be his children because we are believing in what he has done. Not what we have done, but what he has done. John Stott was a pastor in, in um, London a number of years ago. <clears throat> he wrote this thing about his belief in God. He said, I can never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, <clears throat> the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I've had to turn away. In an imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through his hands and feet, being lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. That's the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings became more manageable in light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross which symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in such a world as ours. That's why when we say Good Friday, we're not just looking at the events that happened, because in man's estimation, those were tremendously hideous events. You ever look at the cross and how it was depicted? It's a terrible thing to see. But if we look at what happened on the cross, we look at the work of Christ on the cross. This one who was infinite, this one who was God in the flesh, willingly subjecting himself to this act that one time for all mankind would take on the sins of mankind if we come in faith, repent, and believe. That's why tonight we're going to participate in communion. <clears throat> it's one of the most poignant pictures that we have, of course, of what Jesus did. And Paul revealed this in the book of 1 Corinthians, when he said that Jesus himself revealed these things to him, he said, I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you at the Lord Jesus in the night in which he betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let me stop just a little bit there. Do you think the disciples knew what he was talking about? I don't think they did. I think they were still, okay, they're like, well, this is the Old Testament Seder. This is Passover. So we get that. But now he's saying this is this is his body for us. I don't think they understood it until after the resurrection. It validated what Jesus was saying. In the same way, he took the cup. Also after supper, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So you see, what we do in taking these elements, we're proclaiming not just belief, but we're, we're, we're proclaiming acceptance. 
we're proclaiming, me too. I'm under the cross, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. That's why Paul says it's a serious thing. He goes on and says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Because he says that what happens when you do that, if that's not been appropriate, you're saying something that is not true. And so that's why we would say, if you know Christ, you're more than welcome to come. But if this is something new for you, or if you know that this is not something you're really comfortable with, then pass the elements by. There's no harm in that. This is between you and God. So we're going to bow in prayer. We're going to pass the elements, and we'll hold them together. We'll have the bread and the cup together. And then to use that as a time just to reflect, and Titus is going to lead us in some singing, or just a quiet meditation. And then uh, I'll lead us as we partake together. So let's let's pray. <clears throat> now, Father, we thank you that you have not only prepared the way for us, but you've done everything that's necessary for us to come. It's like someone that would prepare a meal, and they would gather all the food and and the utensils, and they bring it into the kitchen, and they would do all that was necessary to prepare the meal, and then the family would sit down and eat the meal. You not only prepared the way for the cross, but when you came literally into the arena of the cross, you became, according to this picture, you became the meal that we participate in by repenting of our sin and believing in what you've done for us. So, Father, we thank you that as we come now, we can proclaim your death and we can proclaim that you are Lord of all, 